Um, let's start. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to welcome you. Uh, I am uh, Antoine Duval. I'm a senior researcher at the Ars Institute and the coordinator of our Doing Business Right uh, research project that is focusing on, on legal responsibility of transnational corporations and uh, for human rights violations, but also for environmental uh, damages. Um, and it's, it's my pleasure um, to welcome you today for our second uh, DBR digital discussion. We had one on, on the Kayobel case in, in October, and I'm uh, very happy uh, to, to welcome uh, a number of uh, excellent speakers to talk today about uh, uh, fighting global deforestation through due diligence, but in particular about uh, the recent uh, European Parliament uh, resolution providing recommendations on a new legal framework to halt and reverse EU-driven global deforestation. So this event has been jointly uh, organized with uh, Enrico Patiti, uh, who is also a speaker today. Um, and, um, and, and I'm really uh, looking forward to, to the discussion. Um, so in particular, I think, and, and we will elaborate on that uh, through the different presentations, um, we or I am also personally particularly interested in, in discussing the, the idea of turning to, to mandatory due diligence to deal with this issue. I think uh, uh, obviously uh, there is a strong interest uh, from our side on, on deforestation, but as well on the mechanism, on why, why uh, using mandatory due diligence. And I think this is uh, a question that I, I would like us to, to unpack uh, with the speakers, but also uh, with the participants through, through the possibility to, to raise questions via the, via the chat. Um, so to do so, I'm very happy to welcome first uh, Delara Burka, Burkhardt. Um, and, and you are a, a German MEP, uh, but uh, for the SND group. Um, but you are also the, the rapporteur, and most importantly for our purposes, the rapporteur uh, for the NV committee on the initiative report that is behind the resolution. And, uh, and, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation, both of the report, uh, of the resolution, but also a bit about what pushed you towards due diligence, um, towards mandatory due diligence, advocating for mandatory due diligence in the report, um, and also in terms of uh, your thinking behind, behind that mandatory due diligence turn from a political perspective. So, so that would be, uh, you will be our first speaker. You will have approximately 15 minutes and uh, your intervention will be, uh, will be followed by, by comments um, uh, by originally three experts, but unfortunately Miriam Wortel, who is working for, for the Dutch authority on enforcing the, the EU timber regulation is not available today. Um, and that is a pity because she would have brought uh, to the table her real practical experience in dealing already with a different, but also a due diligence regime. Uh, and I know she has a lot to say about it because she uh, participated in an event last year uh, that we organized. And it was really interesting to hear uh, her take on the practice of due diligence on a daily basis. Um, but so we will have uh, two interventions instead of three. Um, the first one uh, will be Mr. Andrea Carta, uh, who is a senior legal strategist for, for Greenpeace in, in Brussels. And you will obviously provide your, your NGO perspective to the discussion and maybe to uh, also contextualize uh, the role or the position of NGOs vis-a-vis -vis the use of mandatory due diligence. And not only obviously in the context of deforestation, because as many of the uh, participants know probably there is also a much broader discussion about mandatory due diligence ongoing at the EU level uh, for general uh, uh, legislation on the topic. And, and maybe it would be interesting if, if you could connect those two uh, in, in your commentaries. And, and finally, uh, the, the final commentator will be Enrico Patiti, uh, who is a former colleague of mine uh, and, and currently an assistant professor at uh, uh, Tilburg University. And uh, your work is uh, focused on transnational sustainability standards, transnational private regulation in, in this field. 
Um, and in particular, connected also to deforestation through so a variety of publications that, that you have uh, published. Um, and I think if I'm not misinformed, and I'm not, uh, that you were also involved a bit in advising on, on the resolution and on the, the background report, and maybe that I'll talk about, as well about that, but uh, that, that you were also, uh, as an academic, obviously, involved in this due diligence turn. And I would like to hear about you, from you about, from more an academic perspective, um, in terms of uh, what type of of changes to the approach to uh, the regulation of sustainability and of transnational corporations, this due diligence uh, turn imply um, from a, a regulatory theory perspective almost. Um, so this few presentation will be, uh, will be uh, followed by a round of Q&A uh, through again the chat uh, box. Uh, I need to warn you that uh, we are live on YouTube, so your questions will also go live on YouTube. So if you want to uh, stay anonymous, uh, uh, you can uh, decide not to raise those questions through the box, but also to send them to me directly uh, via a direct message. Um, so with no further ado, because we have a limited amount of time, uh, Mrs. Burkhardt, I give you the floor for approximately 15 minutes and I will, I will signal the end of the 15 minutes uh, when they come. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I'm very happy about everyone who joined the webinar today because I think it's hard to take the eyes of uh, the results from the elections in the US. So happy to discuss um, this important issue with you, which also might be connected to the success uh, of having mandatory judiciaries uh, in a European context. Um, first of all, I really would like to thank the, the ESSA Institute for the work it is doing on responsible business conduct, which helped me a lot in drafting my report. And I'm sure Mr. Patiti will recognize some of his research in, in my report. And in my introductory statement, I would like first to explain what is the main approach of my report and why I chose this approach. And then I would, of course, like to present the main elements of my report. And lastly, I would also like, because I think it's also interesting to give a little preview of what will happen next and how um, this um, proposal from the parliament might actually become uh, real, real poli policies. So um, the starting point of my work was the so-called communication by the European Commission on protecting the world's forest in July last year. Communications are policy documents where the Commission analyzes a problem and lists potential political answers to these problems. And in this communication, the Commission came to the conclusion that forests are mostly cleared to make room for agricultural production. About 80% of the destruction can be directly attributed to this. Also, goods that end up on the European market, especially soy, palm oil, meat, corn, rubber, coffee and cocoa contribute to the worldwide destruction of forests. So 10% of global forest destruction can be attributed to the European consumption of such goods. Thus, the European Commission announced that it would be would present regulatory measures in 2021, this was that they were saying, to tackle this problem. I it did, did not say whatever, what kind of regulatory measures they want to take in place. That's why the European Parliament appointed me to formulate the Parliament's position on this issue to the point out what kind of regulatory measures the EP would like to see uh, putting in place. And at the beginning of the debate, there were, broadly speaking, three options on the table that were mostly discussed, which were voluntary commitments by companies, third party certification schemes and labels, and mandatory due diligence. Voluntary measures were, were dismissed quite early because the previous voluntary commitments by companies to make their supply chain sustainable have had, as you all know, very little effect. In recent years, we have seen huge corporate commitments, but little progress. And so we have the problem that at the moment we cannot say with certainty whether the products we buy and consume every day, whether the coffee beans of the coffee we drink in the morning, uh, kind of a lot last night, or the cocoa beans and the palm oil and the chocolate we eat, may not have contributed to the destruction of forests. Until now, there's no European law that will pro prohibit this. Some believe that this problem can be addressed with third 
party certification schemes and labels that indicate whether the product is deforestation free or not. And I think that is the wrong approach. First, labels shift, re shift responsibility for deforestation free consumption to the consumers. Secondly, I think that deforestation free products must be the norm on the European market. When consumers refill their fridges, they shouldn't have to choose whether they want to contribute to the destruction of forests or not. Moreover, over currently existing certi certification schemes have their own issues. For instance, they don't cover all relevant products, they don't cover the full supply chain, or they're out of date as um, fraudulent. That's, that is why I proposed in my report that the EU adopts a regulation for mandatory due diligence that obliges companies and investors to ensure that their products and services do not contribute to the destruction or degradation of forests and important ecosystems or to the violation of human rights. My report establishes that companies can only bring certain commodities like soy, beef, leather, palm oil, rubber, cocoa, coffee, or maize on the European market if these are not linked to deforestation, ecosystem conversion and degradation, and also human rights violations. To that end, my report um, proposes now four duties for companies. The first one will be the duty of due diligence. Companies have to assess the risk of the practices on forest ecosystems and people in all steps of their value chain and take action where they identify risk to mitigate or prevent them. Firstly, they have to map and make transparent their entire value chain with the aim to have certainty that their products do not come from lead that until a certain point in the past, we didn't agree on the final date yet, could be identified as natural forest land and was converted for other land use afterwards. Secondly, the same shall apply for other ecosystems because it would be insufficient to only protect forests with these measures since agricultural production would then simply shift to other areas. In Brazil, this could be observed in, in recent years where the Cerrado Savana or the Pantanal wetlands have been increasingly converted into agricultural land. I therefore suggested that other ecosystems that are species rich and important for the climate should be covered by the regulation too. So it's example given the savannas, the peatlands, swamps, mangroves, etc. And thirdly, they shall have to prove that their products are not linked to violations of international human rights, such as the land use rights, basic labor rights, or the rights to informed and voluntary consent. That is because the violation of human rights, particularly the rights of indigenous people, illegal land grabbing and violent conflict over land is often inextricably linked to the destruction of forests. The second duty that is uh, introduced in my report is the duty of consultation. Companies shall consult with stakeholders, NGOs, trade unions, affected communities, scientists, etc., about the design of their due diligence systems and their risk assessments. Companies should also install with that an early warning mechanism where stakeholders can warn them about potential and actual risks. I think this is very important as they are experts on the ground and can help to prevent harm before it already happens, which is important. The third duty that is, that is introduced is the duty of transparency and reporting. Companies shall regularly and publicly report about their risk assessments, activities and outcomes. This shall allow also third parties to scrutinize their activities, which was something very um, harsh, uh, very close in the, in the world we, ha we had in the parliament. The fourth um, duty that is introduced is the duty of documentation. Companies shall keep records of all the activities and make them available upon request by national authorities to investigate potential failures to comply with the regulation. So th these duties that, is, that, that are introduced have to apply to all companies placing forest risk commodities on the EU market for the first time, irrespective of their size. The report also calls for banks and other investors to take their responsibility, which is different, for example, for other due diligence systems that are already in place um, or discussed in some member states, which are based on, um, have a distinction of, uh, of size, for example, from the companies. They should be subject to the same duties. And as the global witness, uh, NGO Global Witness found out between 2013 and 2019, European investors financed activities worth of 7 billion euros for six agribusinesses alone, which contributed to the destruction of forests in the Amazon, Congo, and Papua New, New, Papua New, New Guinea. Sorry, I, that was hard to pronounce. 
Um, so the last key element I would like to mention, um, which is in my report, is the enforcement of these rules. Where companies do not fulfill their duties, they shall be sanctioned in an effective, dissuasive, and proportionate way. This was also very, mu very much discussed in, in the parliament. Where human rights violations or the destruction of nature took place in a value chain, although a company could have had influence to avoid this, or where risks in the value chain were misjudged and resulted in damages, European companies should be held liable under civil law for these damages and provide compensation. Contrary to what is often claimed by the business community and the conservatives also in the parliament discussion, companies should therefore not be held responsible for processes over which they don't have any influence on. They should merely comply with their own duty of care. You can imagine that this was one of the most contested elements of the report. Third parties should also have the possibility to report violations within companies and to national authorities. There should be Europe-wide minimum standards for the frequency, and I, I bet this would something that was, would have mentioned by the colleague uh, from the Netherlands. Um, yeah, where, where we have a, a, a minimum standards for frequency and quality of inspections of the national authorities. Um, and this is where we learn, can actually learn most from the weaknesses of the EU timber regulation. So what's next? You know that the European Parliament formally has no right of initiative. So you might think what we voted on in the resolution does not have an effect. However, Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen promised in her inauguration speech that she would take initiatives of the parliament serious and would take them also on board for legislative proposals. So of course the expectation is very high now that they will implement the proposals coming from the parliament also being included in their own um, uh, report. And we know that the commission will present a legislative proposal to halt and reverse EU driven global deforest deforestation in the second quarter of 2021. So I think your webinar comes very timely because it's uh, now time uh, to keep up the pressure on the commission to stick to this promise and transform my report in a commission proposal for legislative action. So thank you again for the invitation. I'm looking forward to the comments and also on the discussion with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for, for keeping the time really sharply. Um, so this uh, gives me the chance to turn right now to, to Andrea for, for your comment. You have approximately 10 minutes. Um, feel free to, to use them, or, but I will remind you at the end of the 10 minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks to Ms. Burkhardt for uh, being in, in this uh, very interesting discussion after sometimes after the the vote in the report that was uh, <laughs> probably like kept us awake more than than the vote that is going on in the states. I have to say at least like for me personally. Uh, and, and thanks uh, also Antoine and and uh, Vico for like now having like giving us this opportunity to have a bit of a wrap up. Um, when I was thinking about what I would say today, I felt like I would have liked to make uh, uh, four points, also taking into account that we are into a, an academic uh, context. So it's also nice sometimes to take a step back and see what this report really means uh, beyond the report itself. Uh, on uh, um, the substance of, of, of the report, uh, uh, Ms. Boycott has already said a lot. Uh, with which um, we, we definitely agree. I think uh, uh, there is a lot of value in, in, uh, in this document um, precisely for the, the, the kind of, of legislation it foresees, uh, the fact that it, that it envisages the, the protection of natural ecosystems and human rights beyond simply forests. So it avoids problems switching from one place to, to the other. Uh, the, the idea of including financial operators that is like cutting the link between finance and deforestation. So going beyond, uh, beyond consumption. Uh, the fact that, that it starts defining sustainability criteria, whereas uh, uh, the solutions that were envisaged to this point, and we think about the UTR were limited 
to legality. Uh, the fact that it lays out the due diligence requirements in, in quite a, a detailed way. Uh, and the fact that and I think like that, that is definitely a, a, a quite innovative point, the idea of linking a civil liability mechanism to a regulatory process. And we've seen, we've witnessed in the game of the amendments, really how this point was, was controversial. And there was also, there were also, uh, we know very well that politics happen on Twitter these days. We could clearly see how certain stakeholders uh, put front and center the issue of liability in their communication. Um, I mean, I have to say it is a fact. I'm not inventing anything that part of the industry was quite against the, the, this idea. So there is a lot to build on in, uh, in this report. And uh, there is a lot still that the commission will have to do. It's a bit of a pity that, that the, the representative of the Dutch competent authority is not with us today, because I think that where, if you want like the, the executive, that is the, the commission as a technician, will have to make an effort of creativity is really to put in place all the institutional and procedural framework to make sure that these rules in substance can actually work. Because what we have seen, with the, the timber regulation was uh, a lack of communication between competent authorities, a lack of communication between custom authorities and UTI authorities, um, a lack of uh, effective communication between the commission and the rest of the competent authorities, uh, procedural issues on how to take into account uh, um, complaints by, by civil society and so on and forth. So uh, in terms of the substance, the, the report covers it all. It gives really like a very good and strong mandate on what needs to be achieved. And uh, we have heard the commission say like, it's not enough to have a, a good uh, uh, law. It also needs to be implementable or enforceable well that's precisely where they need to go the extra mile and be uh, creative considering also that th there are already uh, areas of eu law where this is happening let's think about uh, the coordination of of uh, uh, competition authorities under uh, the old regulation i think it was one 2003 it was my, my past life or what happens in the sector of, of communication. You have regulators in different member states that talk in a formal way and uh, address and solve problems and also like create a level of certainty for companies so that nobody can say, oh, the due diligence is too difficult to implement. So that will, will have to be done and that's the job that, uh, that the, the, com the part that the commission really needs to nail and uh, there will have to be a, an extra effort. Uh, then on, on the specific question, why, uh, why the due diligence? Well, as, a, as a, uh, I mean, I think from, from the perspective of, 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 of Greenpeace, but like also from my own view, we're not, in love with, with, with the due diligence as such. Uh, it, if it were possible for national authorities to go and check every single shipment of soy, cocoa, meat, you name it, that would be perfect, but it is not possible. And, and what is necessary then is to make sure that, that uh, we have a mechanism in place that, that still um, enshrines the, the principle that the operator is responsible. And due diligence is really like the mechanism that is the most centered on the operator's liability. You can take like, like the IUU carding system and that's a state to state mechanism. You can take certifications and you don't know where liability goes. 
if it's the, the certifying body responsible or if it's the, 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 the operator that uses it, it, it really creates a, a certain or like an unacceptable level of complication. Labels, as we say, is the most unfair of all because it puts like this kind of uh, um, blackmailing on, on the consumer. So due diligence is probably like the, the, the best the best and the most reasonable tool. Now, that said, what is the difference between this model of due diligence and the, the broad uh, corporate due diligence instrument? Uh, well, let's start a little bit from, let's take a step back. Due diligence is, is just uh, a procedure. What qualifies it is the objective. It's the outcome. And uh, what, I, what we want with a corporate due diligence instrument is that a corporate structure has uh, procedures and systems in place so that it doesn't cause harm in general, in all sectors, as a basic element of the DNA for a corporate to exist. So no longer just uh, do the interest of, of the shareholder, but also like do not create damages around. And, uh, and that is the, the objective of this like broad horizontal instrument that DG Justice is making. What we want with this FERC due diligence is an obligation of result. So the, the, uh, the operator here will be obliged to use due diligence to make sure that the products they put on the market are conform and compliant with the European standard that says these products that, that, you, that you buy in the supermarket do not create certain environmental and human rights arms. Uh, so, so there is a fundamental difference. One is an underlying horizontal objective, and this one is equivalent to a product regulation. And, and the underlying horizontal due diligence does not substitute the specific one for products. Just like a company that produces chemicals will still be subject to the reach beyond being subject to this corporate due diligence tool. So, so we, it's not the, the, the fact that there are due diligence uh, procedures uh, mandatory, it does not mean that one due diligence replaces the other or that one or the others are redundant. And here is uh, the conclusion that, that, that I wanted to also make, that it's a little bit conceptual, that I think that what is really ground breaking in this report is that we start treating production and, 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 uh, and processing methods, that is what happens outside the product, as features or characteristics of the product itself, which will have to be, I think like for like a guy like me that, that studied in the 90s, that, that would have been like a taboo, you know, something like you don't do with the law because you need to have free trade, but I think I look with uh, uh, a lot of hope and optimism that we can go like beyond this kind of prejudice that, that the WTO rules are incompatible with these. No, we need to accept that it's not only important to know what's in a product, but also what happens around it and what is the impact. And the only way is to make those who profit from it responsible. I hope I stayed uh, within the time uh, and thank you for your attention. You did, Andrea, you did. Thank you for your intervention. Um, and now let me turn to Enrico and then we, we will turn to the questions that are already piling in in, in the chat box. Enrico, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antoine, and thank you also uh, to uh, Delara Burkhardt and Andra Carta for their, uh, for their remarks. So I'm going to kind of connect a bit to, to what is being said by, by the both of them. And well, indeed, let me start with, of course, this is a rather ambitious draft in the sense that has a rather strong mechanism to ensure that, at least in theory, and then much would 
you rely on the implementation, much will be a due to the implementation, ensures that certain commodities are not ending up in the, uh, in the EU market. There's also quite ambitious provisions on liability and the details of the, um, of the due diligence obligations is rather, is rather high. So it very much depends on what type, of, what type of text, of course, the commission would propose. And there are several other activities that the commission is also engaged in this moment. And, and they should also be considered also in connection to due diligence. So I, I'll talk in a bit about these aspects before focusing a bit more on, on due diligence and specifically the fact that this is this would be uh, human right due diligence or so not just due diligence as in the EUTR. So the commission is, um, is committed to this, of course. Uh, also, the, the Commissioner for Environment committed to a, a draft on uh, on this uh, on this using this this approach along the lines of uh, of the uh, Parliament resolution. Uh, but there are also other initiatives that the Commission is considering, especially in linking these to uh, investment, which is also an important aspect. So defining criteria for investments uh, uh, in, in sustainable commodities, uh, forest partnership initiatives, and, and very importantly, the the, the key elements in, in, in any future plan on, on deforestation would also be the establishment of mechanisms to involve uh, uh, partner countries, producing countries and, and producers on the ground. So it would have to be, there would have to be, I think, and the position of the commission seems seems clear, or at least I, I think it, in my view is quite important that this is one instrument parallel to another set of instruments that would take the uh, uh, kind of uh, a bit like the EUTR, where you have the EU timber regulation that imposes due diligence, and then you have this voluntary partnership agreement negotiated bilaterally uh, with the with the producing countries. Now, this is a kind of a complex issue, and and VPAs uh, are well known for being uh, cumbersome to implement and negotiate, and very challenging for for certain producing countries. But it's really the only way to ensure that. Uh, there is actual implementation on the ground. You need to involve uh, and provide mechanisms for providing also financial incentives, technical assistance, even perhaps cooperation and development uh, funding to ensure that those that will have to uh, implement with this measure, uh, the producers on the ground are on board. And this is also very much connected to the legitimacy of uh, unilateral EU action in, in this domain. And especially mechanism, well, the commission launched just a, a few months ago, I think in September, the Sustainable Cocoa Initiative, which is an interesting uh, kind of commodity, uh, different than the VPA system that were kind of bilateral instrument. This would be a commodity platform where it would also be used as a forum to engage with uh, with producing countries and and where possible forms of engagement also with uh, uh, EU produce EU uh, well entities that market these commodities uh, can be linked and connected to the producers on the on the ground. Uh, so there is indeed this is these are two two sides of the same uh, of the same coin if you wish, and another initiative that of course the Commission is also considering and, and is also assessing how and we'll have to think hard of how how to connect with this draft is the. Uh, uh, is obviously the uh, uh, human right uh, due diligence directive that we're probably even uh, uh, we're probably going to be seeing a text uh, earlier than the, the proposal uh, uh, the commission decided to uh, will likely table uh, on this uh, on on forest and ecosystem risk commodities and the relation between the two is 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 interesting I think um, so there's different ways to go about it I think that you could see a, uh, a regulation tackling deforestation as a kind of more specific sort of add-on to a across the board due diligence directive that imposes general obligation because deforestation concerns are just different and the type of due diligence that you will have to undertake in the palm oil uh, uh, sector and soy sector cocoa is very different from the type of due diligence that is expected in the in the garment sector for example so you know we have already sector specific due diligence instruments like the conflict mineral uh, regulation and this instrument a possible fair regulation could, could kind of build up on general requirements or you could have a detail uh, sort of uh, environmental damage uh, definition with ecosystem definition as well uh, included in the general due diligence regulation. But I guess that that probably a more specific instrument seems uh, seems more seems more um, more adequate. But I want to focus a bit on the on the due diligence side because I'm trying to ask me to elaborate a bit on human right due diligence specifically, and I think it's worth um, stressing the difference with the type of due diligence that takes place under the UTR, because that's where I think it's very interesting and, and where the interesting aspects for implementation, uh, potentially very tricky aspects to can emerge. So in the UTR, you only have an obligation basically of risk management. So it's due diligence as acquiring information about legality, mitigating risk and, and take action if something, something occurs. The text of, of the parliament and, and in line with the UNGPs has additional elements to that. And some were mentioned already by, by Delara Burkhardt. One is, is very important and is the duty of, uh, 
um, well, cooperation, consultation, um, that refers, well, obviously to uh, the engagement that firms will have to uh, uh, enact with uh, stakeholders and human rights holders as prescribed in the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines for um, well, the FAO OECD guidelines on, on the responsible value, agricultural value chain, but also with, and this is very important, I think, with other economic actors outside the EU, because it's only through engagement that uh, actual change in the practices on the ground takes place. Because the last thing we want to see is, is you know, a segregation in which we have these commodities that are you know, connected to deforestation that are just marketed away the EU uh, because it becomes, becomes too, uh, uh, too burdensome. But I think what the, what, the, what the Parliament report would like to achieve, and I think that is also very much in line with a, a very interesting statement in the uh, Green Deal communication, where the Commission states that the type of transformations that we have to see in, in global value chains will take a generation to achieve. So when that is the scale, the temporal scale that we have, I think that what, what is really important is to start a process where companies engage, companies that market in the EU, large retailers, traders of certain commodities that really just a bunch of traders uh, is responsible for 75% for of trading certain commodities. So they have a huge potential in affecting change in their value chains. So this is about engaging them and their suppliers and the producers in developing countries also by providing incentive financial incentives in in in, uh, in enacting uh, uh, programs uh, or, or just in establishing practices that are not detrimental for the environment or even reforestation projects etc so the engagement this is really crucial and it's and it's, it's also very difficult to to uh, legislate it's difficult to impose companies to cooperate in the value chain uh, so that's where also the engagement of institutions also in the framework of a possible vpa like structure would be would be fundamental to bring in eu actors and on the ground producers and, and other intermediate entities that also have a huge potential in affecting change uh, together and, and cooperating so this is the engagement component that is definitely new if, if compared to the utr um, and then there is also the reporting component which is very important and also that is missing in, in the utr so this allows uh, academics ngos whether whoever wants to take the, the pains to read those reports to actually kind of offer a sort of a monitor complementary monitoring mechanisms uh, mechanism in, in, in looking what type of initiatives, what type of uh, uh, diligence processes are in fact established and, and how, which in a way could also um, uh, assist, if, if not informally, uh, enforcement authorities in, uh, in, in, in the more burdensome sort of ex post checks that they are supposed to, to undertake. So that's also, that's also very important, um, a very important aspect. And then of course, there's all the remediation and grievances mechanisms that uh, are also not present in the, in the EUTR, but are, are crucial here. Well, remediation, of course, it's, it's a, will be part of any uh, human right due diligence uh, uh, measure uh, generally or specifically as potentially this one because it's, it's a key aspect of, uh, of human right due diligence as in the UNGPs. And also grievance mechanisms is definitely something that, uh, well, much more work will have to be done at the corporate level to establish mechanisms that are capable of, uh, uh, well, acquiring information, first of all, about what happens on the ground in terms of human rights violation and environmental harm, and then potentially, uh, well, not potentially, actually, it's an it's a, it's a, it's a obligation, establishing mechanisms for, uh, for, remedying, uh, for remedying those. So this is, the, the, I think, the three important aspects that, that human right due diligence adds up to, um, to uh, the uh, UTR setup of the diligence there. And I think it's also very important to note that in a, in a, in a feasibility study that was performed, I think, a couple of years ago, due diligence in line with human right due diligence was designated as the most impactful um, possible regulatory tool among uh, other, uh, such as uh, ranging from voluntary pledges, standards, uh, uh, kinds of consumer information programs. So that's also probably the connection uh, with, with human right due diligence. And just one last aspect on, on due diligence, I think it's also um, very much connected to the EU international obligations here. So I try to zoom out a bit. So you may actually even arguably claim that the EU has an obligation to implement uh, human right due diligence legislation. And by implementing a measure that covers also the environmental aspect of it, that's sometimes a bit neglected in discussion. Um, the EU is basically in line with is just implementing its, its international obligation in this, in this respect. And, and well, we may argue, but, but I think that it's clear, there is a clear connection, of course, with, between deforestation and, and human rights violation, uh, both generally of, of all mankind as climate change has an impact on, on, on human rights largely, 
at, at large, but also specifically for the communities affected. Um, and it's also very interesting to see that you can actually, uh, in spite of moving beyond legality and, and to this extent being some mode of a, a, a unilateral uh, measure, although we can debate about that, uh, there is a connection between a certain, uh, let's say international soft law instruments that are increasingly focused on, um, on zero deforestation. And uh, so they're moving away from legality and, and stressing that deforestation in general is something that is an, uh, an, acceptable an, an unacceptable practice. And you see trace of that in the United Nations uh, and New York Declaration on Forests. These are all soft law instruments, but they're very important. SDG 15 focuses on, uh, um, on ecosystems at large, so not just protecting forests and beyond legality. So the OECD guidelines, OECD file guidelines I mentioned before also covers forest and ecosystem damage. So there is a growing uh, corpus of international soft law that refers to beyond legality uh, that could be that the EU could connect to also to justify internationalism and international law, uh, the imposition of criteria, the imposition of the setting of criteria that go beyond uh, that go beyond legality. Uh, but there's many, many other other things that are very interesting and I'm uh, looking forward to discussing the Q&A, but I, I'd like to, uh, uh, to, to close here. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Enrico. Um, so we already have quite a few questions. I mean, I, I really feel a bit sorry that Miriam is not here because indeed I know what she would have brought on to the table uh, a little bit because she, she came to one event and she presented a little bit her experience dealing with the due diligence process, which is fairly different in the context of the EUTR and a due diligence process limited to a limited amount of companies, uh, limited in scope. And she was really clearly, and I think this is a challenge for this approach, huh? uh, saying that it was extremely time consuming, uh, that it demands a lot of resources to monitor just a few companies under the EUTR. So one of the challenges that we might face uh, is that um, in the enforcement of a due diligence approach, this might demand enormous means um, and I think it, it's a pity again that she's not here to talk about it uh, from her own experience but that's something to keep in mind maybe uh, more broadly for the discussion and let me turn now to um, to I'm not sure what's happening um, to the questions and we have questions by by some uh, speakers that are much more expert on the topic than, than myself uh, such as Jonathan Zeitlin. Uh, for those who don't know Jonathan Zeitlin, uh, he's a professor of uh, governance at the University of Amsterdam and also one of, or maybe probably the leading scholars in studying uh, the EUTR and new governance mechanisms in the context of uh, forestry in particular. So uh, it's, it's an honor to be asking your questions. Um, so Jonathan uh, raised three questions uh, in particular and, and directed particularly to, to you, Delara. Um, the first question was, why does the resolution confine the responsibility for due diligence to the operator that is first putting the first, the first uh, product and that has a forestry uh, specific risk uh, on the EU market when it is widely agreed that this limitation constitutes an important loophole in the EUTR, which should be corrected as part of the ongoing review of the regulation. So that's one first question. And I, I will ask the second one already so that we, we have them bundled. Um, and, and given the limited competences of the EU over penalties, so here we're turning to enforcement uh, set by the member states, how can the proposed legislation ensure that such penalties are consistent with one another across the union? Uh, and this is obviously a big question in, in due diligence mechanism in general, because those will be enforced at the national level. And the idea of having a level playing field might be defeated by the fact that the enforcement might be very different, depending on which national authority is enforcing uh, that due diligence obligation and handing out the sanctions, which will be different in the different countries. Um, so there are maybe that, that's already two quite broad questions. Yeah, um, I'm happy to. Um, and if I don't hit the, the core, please um, ask me again. So uh, when it comes to the, uh, to the first question, when it's um, on the 
uh, it was I, I re read it on the FERC, uh, uh, yeah, on the limitations or the 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 risk of having loopholes uh, like in the UTR, uh, which I agree, but I don't agree that we don't um, um, specify this in in the text um, as the resolution also demands, tr for example, traders to be able to identify whom they bought the products from. Um, whom they sold that to. So I think we we saw this loophole. Of course, it also comes about the specification when um, how effectful we will manage that. But I, I I think with the proposal we we addressed this loophole, um, and um, of course also uh, we will look closely more closely at this and when we have the the every, the impact assessment which is right now conducted by the Commission also on on the. Um, on the enforceability of the EU timber regulation. So I think um, it's an important question you raised, but I, I thought it might be covered by what we propose when we also say traders should be included. Uh, and then when it comes on the penalties, this was the second question. Um, well, this is basically a problem um, sometimes in, in EU um, lawmaking that um, of course the, the enforcement um, and the uh, concretization of the member states is something that uh, might not be in the in the yeah in, in our in, in our field of influences. But um, I propose in the resolution that um, with the penalties there should be a guidance by the Commission Commission what are considered to be effective penalties. But of course you are right that the the in the end it will lie with the member states how they concretely will build build that up on that. Um, and also we want in the proposal, we want to have minimum standards for, for national authorities for the frequency of quality for checks, because it's also uh, connected to the question on when and how penalties should be raised up. So what I'm thinking of, and of course I didn't specify it as we, as we are not in this process of, of the proposal, um, but there needs to be guidance and there need to be, need to be standards on how penalties are supposed to put in place, although, uh, because this is something we learned um, from other things, but I, I completely agree with you that this is a very complex question and we uh, we have to look at how we can have a good guidance that also, um, yeah, desires commitment by the, uh, by the member states to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and maybe, um, I think there was one final question by, by, by Professor Zeitlin, um, and that I think is as well connected to, to maybe uh, my first comment, uh, which is about whether it's reason reasonable to expect that all these different FERCs could be covered by a single competent authority. So here we are really going back to the enforcement of, um, of, of this due diligence obligation. Um, and the monitoring by an administrative authority that would have to cover uh, under the, the current setup of the resolution, all companies, disregarding the side, uh, covering a lot of commodities uh, with uh, an intense, I mean, a, a scope of a due diligence process that is quite wide in terms of what is expected from the companies. So here there is a, a real question to you is, 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 is how do you envisage that enforcement at the national level? I mean, this sounds to me like a huge administrative authority that has to come in. Well, this is not specified in the report as it's not um, something that we can now say, uh, but we will leave that to, to the member states. We will give the guidelines and we'll give the member states, but of course, um, the situation in the different member states are very different. And we also saw that, and I think this is a lesson learned from the EU timber regulation, that uh, we had very different, um, yeah, when it comes to the number of people being involved, but also on the, on the, on the um, regular deal of checks, um, we have lessons learned from that. So I think uh, we, it, I would be lying if I said that we could control what, what will happen with that. Uh, but I, I think what is needed is guidance and uh, concrete standards for the member states to deliver on on, on that uh, and we uh, but of course um, what, as it is complex and we have very different commodities that are taken in place by this proposal uh, we i think there has to be room for the member states to look um, where they want to to have the authorities to be responsible for for the for the for the commodity so i think uh, this is something that where there has to be a, a level playing field for the member states 
maybe now I will let. Uh, so Andrea has a has a hand, hands hands up, and then Enrico, you wanted to intervene, I think, as well. So uh, one after no. the other. But I mean, I wanted to say something on on an issue of of principle, and I think that from the question, what I understand is that we are not yet visualizing the paradigm shift that is needed. I mean, and that is that is represented by 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 this report. Uh, pa paraphrasing a title of, of a book, everything is regulated. I mean, like the, 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 this pencil. Uh, you know, is under some form of regulation. This box is under some form of regulation. So are these headphones. Uh, what do we want to do? We, do we want to leave uh, products unregulated? Well, yes, we can contemplate that hypothesis, but what we have to face is not so much the cost of regulating and enforcement, but the cost and the risks that we are running by not regulating uh, a certain number of commodities, by not preventing the impacts, and, and uh, by not uh, requiring the meeting of, of, of certain standards. So it's, it's like we do not have the option, we no longer have the option, and we are already late, to leave a number of commodities and products unregulated. So whatever it will take, we need to uh, achieve that objective. And as a matter of fact, a lot of products are under regulation. They come through customs, they need to be checked. There are like hygienic rules, safety rules, health standards, whatever. We need to bring environmental and social impacts in the scope of what is regulated. Otherwise, we are going to be in trouble collectively. And the fact that we are not in the same room to discuss this, but we are isolated one from the other, is stands precisely to testify the need for this regulation. Thank you. So, just to kind of comment also on the issue of enforceability. Um, so indeed, what, what I think that is, 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 is crucial here is that uh, human rights due diligence and generally due diligence is a sort of ex post form of accountability, ex ante form of accountability, right? So this is not, it's something that processes and mechanisms that should be implemented in order to avoid damage specifically. So the assumption, I guess, is that processes are implemented properly and this can only be done in a, in a possibly quite extensive time frame for implementation uh, with considerable guidance uh, being, uh, being given. Uh, and I think the solution that Andrea mentioned is certainly quite, quite, quite interesting in terms of having uh, competition authorities like a structure that issue uh, possible you know, guidelines on, on how to implement it in specific, in specific context, possibly even granting exemptions if you want to kind of uh, flagging certain, certain value chains as deforestation free, uh, could be uh, something, something worth, uh, worth looking into. But of course, the, the, the challenge of, of ex post uh, uh, checks is, 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 uh, is indeed, uh, indeed there. Uh, so I think that it would be important to have a structure that ensures that these processes are implemented properly, and then that the threat of enforcement by means of checks remains, uh, remains there, but is not the main means through which uh, we expect to spur companies to, uh, to affect change. In their, in their value chain. And just one, one minor technical point on, on a possible loophole also that, that was oftentimes also considered as, as quite tricky under the EUTR was understanding who places on the market, right? Because it's not so easy for certain commodities or certain products, you know, uh, sold by the internet, on the internet, for example. So I think that the, the position of the, uh, the, the resolution by the parliament also introduces a mechanism that is based on the um, sort of information, uh, uh, market information regulation. So basically each product that is marketed um, or each importer must designate an operator that is responsible uh, for, uh, for compliance with due diligence. So the fact that in some cases it was difficult to understand who placed on the market and who was responsible for the diligence regulation uh, the diligence requirements, this seems to be, seems to be a bit, seems to be tackled. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Thanks, Enrico. Um, I'm going to move on to, to, next, to the next question, but I, I do want to specify that I think this enforcement issue is, is really an important one. And it's not about, you know, um, 
not having or having the due diligence uh, regulations or a mandatory due diligence. It's about what does it mean in practice to have that. And I do think that there is a risk if you don't set up well the enforcement side of that particular regulation, that it becomes just a paper uh, trail type of regulation where uh, due diligence is just about ticking a few boxes. And, and that is uh, really dependent on how you enforce um, that type of due diligence, due diligence based uh, regulation. So I, I think here there, there is really a, a, an important unknown, I would say, at this stage, and that will have to be scrutinized very closely uh, once we have a, a proposal along these lines. Um, so just on, just on this, if I recall correctly, there was also a requirement to audit uh, due diligence systems uh, uh, in the in the Parliament resolution. So that is also a mechanism to uh, uh, okay. to ensure that at least the diligence processes are implemented and operated correctly. Yeah, and I think yeah we could discuss uh, the, the effectiveness of auditing, but that's another, another uh, discussion. Um, let's let's turn to another question by uh, G M Baselmans which I think is also quite relevant. Uh, does this mean that on EU level, we'll have several EU due diligence regulations? Uh, the more specific ones, EU regulation on forest and ecosystem risk commodities, the EU timber regulation, the conflict minimum regulation, and the broad EU due diligence law? It's still not clear to me how these specific due diligence regulations relate to the future broad EU due diligence law. And I think this is also for me, a, a, I mean, a very good question. How, how does that, interact with the general due diligence uh, directive that is coming up uh, early 2021, uh, at least a proposal. So uh, maybe Delara, I, I give you the floor. Yes, uh, I'm afraid I, I cannot give you a final answer because we also in the parliament um, have very different approaches and also different initiatives when it comes to that. Um, I, I know, um, and I think this is a very good, that the Commission is already working overarching between the different DGs to have this current approach and not to have a, like um, different due diligence laws um, all functioning for themselves or not um, fu functioning for themselves. Um, so, and so I think this is very, very, very remarkable. I'm, I'm not too long in European politics, but I, I think there has never been as close exchange between different DGs on how to deliver on a co current comprehensive solution. And this is what is actually happening right now with the multi-stakeholder initiative, but also all the commissioners that might be um, also affected by this with um, the, the, the justice, the trade, they are all working together on, on that. And, I, um, and this is what is happening also uh, before the proposal that will come up next uh, in the beginning of the next year. So I, I'm optimistic of that, that they will um, also work on a current co comprehensive approach. My proposal um, makes more specific demands for products that are um, highly likely to, to are connected with the risk. Um, if, if it would be like my original proposal, uh, I would have proposed that the EUTR should be included uh, on this uh, proposal in a long term, but this didn't find a majority in, in the parliament yet. I think this will might change when we have the commission, which is called for having more competence uh, on on a broad on the broad scope, um, will um, will deliver, uh, make a proposal. So uh, when it was after me, I would have had the UTR being part of of this. Um, proposal and being implemented after a time, but this didn't find a majority. So I think, um, and I'm optimistic about that, that with the, um, with the decision of um, having communication between the DGs, which those who follow European policies for a while know it's not taking for granted, uh, I think there's a good chance that um, we will have a comprehensive current approach coming from the Commission when it comes about that. Thank you. Maybe um, Enrico and Andrea, do you want to jump in on this issue? Yeah, Andrea? Well, I mean, we always forget to mention that there is also uh, money laundering due diligence. <laughs> but, uh, and on top of that, companies normally do antitrust due diligence to make sure that do, they do not violate antitrust rule and they pro probably have internal processes to make sure that workers are safe and so on and forth. Um, the way I personally see it is that this is a, another layer of regulation, 
don't know, standards with which companies are required to comply. They are required to comply with this new layer of regulation because it's necessary, because uh, self-regulation is not working. Uh, but uh, it is perfectly possible for companies to, to, to comply with, with the no deforestation rules as they comply with, with, uh, with other rules. So again, let us not be swayed by the fact that uh, this is another due diligence that they have to carry out because uh, this is the normality for companies of a certain size. They, they need to have processes to check what they're doing and be responsible. Yeah, I mentioned a bit this before in my intervention. So I, I think that I, I don't see a particular problem in having uh, more specialized instruments uh, tackling human rights due diligence in addition to a uh, kind of basic uh, human rights due diligence directive, as long, of course, that there are no, no conflicts. So I think that the future scenario could look like that, where you have a measure, uh, so this human rights due diligence directive that sets basic obligations and also basic uh, requirements concerning liability. And then you have, um, specific, more detailed, possibly even more stringent requirements according uh, to the level of risk in specific uh, supply chains, which is something that is absolutely in line with the NGPs, by the way, uh, the United Nations Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights that prescribed that diligence should be announced uh, where risks are, are uh, increasing and priorities can be, can be established in order to address the most serious risks. So I think it's very much in line, in line to that. Um, so you could have indeed a, a requirement uh, that only certain commodities that have no environmental, uh, negative environmental impact can be marketed. So connect due diligence uh, to market assets. Uh, but at least in the draft that I've seen in the, uh, in the EU committee in the European Parliament, when there is no uh, connection between market assets and due diligence, uh, we have to take into account some awkward situations that will arise um, if uh, a producer is aware that there are human rights violations connected or deforestation impacts uh, connected to their products, and then they market those products. Because we have recent case law by the Court of Justice that says that breaches of uh, human rights uh, in general international law, and this was the case about the labeling of uh, um, wine that originated from uh, occupied territory, that breaching international law and non communicating it to consumers, at least, it could constitute a sort of misleading, misleading consumers. And it's a bit of an awkward uh, way around uh, enforcing uh, human rights uh, obligations by, by, by linking it to consumer protection. But, but it seems that it's not so easy for an operator to market products after they have, at least in light of this ruling, after they have found out that they are associated to, uh, to, to human rights or, or negative impacts. So, there are, there are different, different connections between the different uh, approaches that we may see. Well, this one was specifically concerning market assets and due diligence, but I think that it's possible to have, to have instruments that are uh, aligned uh, with respect to the basic requirements, and then there's more detailed um, requirements and procedures uh, for specific type of risks. Thank you, Michael. Um, and actually, I have a question for you directly from, uh, from Vibe Duma also from a colleague of mine. Um, so he says he agrees that VPAs are preferable instruments, but in practice, in spite of years and years of negotiations and, future, and further work, so far only one country has a functioning VPA, as far as I know. As long as enforcement of EUTR is not improved, why would countries bother with VPAs from a trade perspective? No, indeed, it is. It is it, the, the, the main issue that I also mentioned before concerning involving uh, involving stakeholders and involving a partner partnering countries. Uh, these are extremely burdensome uh, uh, mechanisms to uh, to implement. And and the idea behind the UTR was that we give market access uh, through the uh, uh, through the UTR if you are party of a, of a country or a producer that are party of a VPA. But then if there are loopholes in the implementation and in the enforcement, why bother entering into an agreement? My producers can just sneak into the EU market regardless. So the point is absolutely, absolutely valid. But I think that efforts will have to be made and, and also in connection to uh, well, different form of financing to kind of force in a way or, or stimulate support uh, and push as much as possible um, countries to, to participate uh, into this type of, into this type of, uh, of agreements where, I mean, from the perspective of what is 
kind of requested. So it doesn't have to follow this, this type of structures do not have to replicate the administrative procedures and, 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 and bureaucratic and, and administrative issues that are connected to the VPA in the sense that I, I, they do not necessarily have to issue, uh, you know, deforestation free licenses as, as in the VPA. Uh, so we can think of a less burdensome uh, structure where the administrative uh, machinery is not established in the developing in, in the, the producing country member in the producing country, uh, but but there is agreement uh, at, through engagement on on criteria and on how to uh, support uh, and facilitate implementation on the ground. So kind of VPA light in terms of the obligations that are um, uh, expected on the uh, on the on the EU partner, but the point is indeed a very a very sticky and very tricky aspect. Does one of you, Delara or Andrea, wants to jump in on VPAs? Maybe because we had it also in the discussion in the partnership uh, in the parliament. Um, I think what is needed is a is a new generation of VPAs, which which is more 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 bind more binding in in this point. So um, I was it was a little bit difficult. Also, of course. Um, and I, I want to just, as a as a member of European Parliament, make that aware. Um, a, a problem is that we we lack courage sometimes between different committees in the proposals, and I think this would be a big task when it comes to the future of EPAs, but also um, trade agreements in general. That we cannot um, have um, proposals for regulations that go beyond legality uh, on one point, but on the other hand, don't look um, if we are they are current with actions we do, for example, when it comes to VPAs and trade agreements. So um, I think this is something where we have to, to also mobilize um, from, 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 from civil, civil, maybe also Greenpeace wants to, um, Andrea wants to say something by that, because I think uh, what is crucial with that is that there's coherence when it comes about the VPAs. There's also an opinion I, I um, I think you also should read from from the inter committee, from the trade committee, uh, on my proposal, which um, goes on the situation of the uh, of the VPAs. This was not in the competence um, of my report, and also not in the competence of of my committee. So, and there's always a little bit technical problems to make a current approach in the daily way how uh, pro pro proposals are being made uh, within the parliament. So. Um, yeah, I, I think what is needed is, is a new generation of VPAs. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. But, I mean, for us, the, the important thing is that we, we, let's say, define where we set the bar. That is like we use, as it's always been used, the internal market as the pivot, as, as the, the, the first point. First, we define what we want. And then, of course, we can set in place all the accompanying measures that can be uh, VPAs uh, or can be a specific measure. Somebody, I, I, I think, has asked these to protect uh, smallholders and, and local communities and, and ensure that they can have access to the market. All of this is good, but uh, we needed to, as if it looks normal to start first by defining the rules and then working on the exceptions. If we, if we take the, the UTR, VPAs are, let's say, like a special regime. They come on top of it. And, uh, and uh, I think we should proceed in, in the same way. First, uh, define how the market needs to be regulated, not forgetting the fact that we also want to regulate European forest and, 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 and protect those forests and ecosystems that are within the EU, and then see all other tools that can be put in place to, to promote uh, compliance, uh, let's say, like across the borders. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have, uh, Delara, you wanted to add? Maybe just one addition to that, because I think it's crucial that we also say that. Um, that the, the question of VPAs is not only one um, one that is coming um, 
when it comes about the effectiveness, but it's also something when it comes about enforcement, because we know the different complexities uh, of the commodities we are dealing with. So um, I, I think that there will be no way um, with, with, with a new generation of VPAs to be part of the solution when it comes to the enforceability, because this is always what also comes from, from some industries as, as their ma major point of why they are opposing it. Um, so I think we should have an answer on that, you know. This is why I think we, we should discuss it with, with this overall context. Um, although I'm not an expert on that and cannot deliver you the right answers, but I think it's, it should be um, kept in mind because it's something that is uh, also important for enforceability of, of a regulation. Okay, and I have a, I think the, the final question, the only one that we haven't dealt with right now in the, in the chat uh, by Tammy Vallejo. And um, I, I'm not sure I grasped the entire question, but I think I, I think she she's asking basically whether there are any risks that, that this regulatory approach would be uh, uh, discriminatory in a way against small producers, especially probably from developing countries, and uh, will impose a specific burden on them uh, to be able to import uh, in into the EU market. Um, because she adds that there is being marginalized smallholders farmers out of the market. So, and that's maybe a, an issue that we haven't really focused on until now, but um, what it's a bit this Brussels effect uh, in, in how far will it have, uh, uh, could it have such an approach, a negative effect on, on, on small producers, which are not in a position to provide maybe the necessary information to be included in a, in a due diligence process and therefore might be excluded entirely from, from the EU market. Um, what's, your, what's your position on that? Maybe De La Rai and then, and then Mathieu. Um, so when I see it correctly in the chat, the first question again was, um, uh, what is the approach towards due diligence? Um, and it's it's about having uh, to set EU standards. So when a company thinks it cannot reduce the level of risk to environment and human rights damage to a ne negligible level, it shall not, shall not be legal to place the product on the EU market. This is the, the basic principle. Um, so um, the report, but also especially with the with the question you are raising about how it affects smallhold farmers. Um, is that the report also stresses that existing certification schemes, including, for example, their multi-stakeholder initiatives, um, should continue to play a role to inform companies in this due diligence process. So there can be an additional tool. Um, and what is important on that point, it should not take away, and this is the difference um, I, I make uh, also uh, to, to those who want a certification scheme-based approach, it should not take away the company's liability when we have the, um, the certification schemes and their multi-stakeholder initiatives as, as being something that might also help um, small farmers to, do, um, to know about the demands. So um, I think this is crucial about that. And it's not, um, it, the crucial thing is that we are talking about the liability of the companies in the process of due diligence. And actually also this, um, this argument is always something that interestingly, the governments, for example, from Brazil are, are raising that we don't want to produce, uh, to damage the smallhold farmers, but uh, we know that those who are actually doing the most harm to, when, to ecosystems, to human rights, um, are not the smallhold farmers. So I think uh, we have to watch out that this is not a um, something where you can kill the debate from the start. I think we have to watch out that we we say that there are tools and there are instruments that help um, smallhold farmers to be part of the solution on that. Um, and this is why I'm not afraid that the, the proposal will harm it if we implement it correctly. Thank you, Leon. Any of you, Enrico, Andrea, wants to jump, jump in on this question? No, I, I, I think I think De Lara has, has framed it uh, in a very effective way. I mean, it's uh, there can be accompanying policies and measures around it, but we should not fall in a sort of like a Stockholm syndrome where. Uh, where uh, small holders become victim of of, uh, of of the gatekeepers. I mean, like they need to be helped to comply, 
but uh, but they will have to comply. And on Brazil, uh, some time some time ago, uh, there was this this uh, article that came out to, from Politico. Uh, the vast majority of of, uh, of illegal soy coming from Brazil could be tracked to five or six players. So at the end of the day, like there will have to be rules to, to catch these those big fish and then and then like we can think about all, obviously about those who are the, the more vulnerable vulnerable with appropriate instruments so yeah my, my point my, my take would be the following indeed there, there is a potential a potential threat in the sense that uh, there may be some some trade distortion or some tendency to avoid the most complicated value chain bits. But so the measure could, could come up come with a a smallholder carve out in a way where uh, a smallholder farming defined in a certain way uh, could be uh, could be could, could be could be fine. Um, but it, th there are several initiatives, private initiatives that that tackle this issue and and, and show that there are ways to engage. Uh, and to bring in the uh, sort of uh, the retailer or the, the firms with large market power in supporting and financing even uh, smallholders in, in reforestation, afforestation uh, programs, et cetera. But this is really where landscape-based initiatives, jurisdiction-based initiatives uh, are, are key. And you also see the accountability framework initiative has a very interesting guideline uh, on, uh, on exactly this issue. So how to uh, bring in a, a smallholder and, uh, and make sure that the, uh, the large entities contribute to their uh, compliance with the measure. And this is also where I see a comment from Matteo in the chat, uh, where also private schemes are, are doing quite a lot recently. Uh, so RSPO is a program called Share Responsibilities that really bring in uh, different value chain actors, commit them to purchase more, including also from smallholders, kind of to lift them up and, and make sure that, uh, that, that, they, that they are capable of complying. So there are interesting mechanisms that are being developed where, where this threat is, uh, is, is at least uh, uh, softened uh, or uh, lessened. Yes, I mean, maybe that's almost the final word because we are running a bit out of time, but uh, um, indeed Matteo mentioned certification schemes and I'm not sure um, whether, whether Bilara, you would like to elaborate a little bit on, on the role that you see for certification schemes in, in, in that broad you know, human rights due diligence turn context in fighting due deforestation? The role in the due diligence mechanism. Yes. Okay. Yeah, this is basically what I tried to, maybe in not my very good English, not made it too concrete. Um, so uh, basically existing certification schemes can help um, companies, but also relevant actors to ex access the risk in their, in their compassion and they, they already are in place. But what, what is the importance? Um, I, I'm not I'm saying that they shouldn't play a role and they cannot set standards, but the, the, the question that is crucial for me is that they cannot leave out companies uh, from the duty of due diligence. This is what um, some proposals also that were um, made to, to my, some amendments that made, were made to my um, proposal were referring to that, um, that certification schemes can be an industry standard and therefore due diligence does, should not be um, checked anymore. So it should, should, should not be conducted anymore. And I don't think this would be right. I want them to be an auxiliary tool um, to assess the risk, to, to mitigate the risk, but not to, um, to be something that leaves you out of the responsibility of conducting your due diligence. So they are an, an help, help tool, um, to put it like this, um, but they should not take away um, also the liability. Okay, I think uh, we, are, we are already 20 minutes, I think, over the time that we have uh, scheduled. So, um, I, I want to thank you, uh, the three of you, for, for joining the discussion and for your, your insights. I want to thank, uh, obviously, the participants uh, for their questions and uh, for their interest. Um, we will uh, most likely, uh, so the, the video is, uh, is available on YouTube if you want to, to send it to those that couldn't be with us today, they can uh, rewatch it um, thereafter. Um, I think uh, Jonathan Zeichlin has also shared on the, on the chat, uh, I think it's visible to everybody, uh, 
uh, a link to uh, the video of an event that was organized by the University of Amsterdam on, on a similar topic, but a, a broader event, uh, I think, two weeks ago. And uh, that might be also of interest to, to all to the participants. Again, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and I wish you a, a good evening waiting for the, for the results of the elections, a second night. <laughs> good night. Yeah, good. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. And watch out. There's also the public consultation from the Commission on the proposal next year. Indeed. So, indeed, that's to, right. To interact with that. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>